Thank you, Freddie. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, this is my talk about the tool chain I use to produce my uh, presentation slideshows, including this one. <laughs> so, the motivation is that I do technical presentations. What do I mean by technical presentations? Uh, presentations that are going to include a lot of you know, dot points like this, just regular talking points, but also source code, uh, software source code, uh, math, diagrams, etc. Uh, I want my presentations to look nice. Those of you who've seen me present before know that most of my slide decks are fairly uh, simple. I want simple, but I want them to look nice as well. I don't want people to look at comic songs and want to gouge their eyes out if they look at my slides or uh, be distracted by what's on the slides. So I want my presentations to look nice, but at the same time, I personally just want to focus on writing the content of my talk and not spend an inordinate amount of time uh, stuffing around with the formatting to get them to look good. So I want to efficiently go from a talk that's, that's in my head or that's in some software and turn that into a presentation with the least amount of effort and a, uh, an attractive artifact at the end. So I'm going to talk about my slide tool chain. Um, this talk is absolutely not prescriptive. There are many variations on this tool chain um, that you could employ or you, know, you could take some of my ideas or none of them. You might decide this is not how I want to write slides. That's fine. I'm sorry, you, you might be bored for the next half hour, 40 <laughs> minutes. Um, but hey, that's, that's what you signed up for if you're sitting here, so. <laughs> <laughs> feel, free, feel free to leave. Um, no, so, so yeah, it's, it's very much focused on what I do to write slides. You might find that there are some good ideas that you would like to employ, you might not. But either way, it's fine with me. Um, I'm going to have lots of kind of source to output examples, and I'm also going to do a bit of live hacking of the slides to look at things like um, uh, themes and, and colors and um, various tweaks to the formatting that we can do. Um, so that's going to be probably the first half of the slideshow, just looking at some before and after examples. Uh, I'm going to conclude by having a brief look at some Pandoc internals. Um, Pandoc is one of the, well, it's the main tool really in the um, tool chain. Um, and uh, you'll see some LaTeX in this talk, but it is definitely not a LaTeX tutorial. It's not trying to be in any way, shape or form. There's just way too much depth there. So you might see some stuff. If you're, if you're familiar with LaTeX, you'll be comfortable. If you're not, you'll think like, what the hell am I looking at? Um, just roll with it. Um, you can learn to take another day. So my tool chain is uh, basically I write my slides in the restructured text uh, markup format, uh, which is a lightweight markup format. Um, I can fall back to writing raw the tech if or when I need to. So if I need a bit more power or control over the presentation, again, not that I want to spend um, a lot of time focusing on that, but sometimes the things that you want just can't be expressed in the lightweight markup format. So I can break out of that into all the tech when I need to. And then I use Pandoc to convert that restructured text document um, with or without um, <coughs> raw LaTeX sections within it uh, into a PDF slideshow via the LaTeX Beamer document class. So Beamer is a uh, LaTeX document class for slideshows. Um, so basically what happens is Pandoc um, will take my restructured text, um, turn that into a, an AST, an internal representation of the document, um, convert that into LaTeX, plug it into a template, and um, then that formatted template will get turned into a PDF for, um, PDF for tech. Restructured text uh, is a lightweight markup format. As I said, uh, you might know it just as REST. Um, the file extension is just .rst in most cases. 
Um, the format originated from the Python DocuTools project and is heavily used in the Python community, but also elsewhere. Uh, and it predates Markdown. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Correct. Um, Pandoc uh, is heralded as a universal document converter. How universal? Name some, name some you know, markup formats or document formats. DocX. Yep, it does it. And Enroth. Enroth. Can, read, can read and write DocX. Enroth? Um, it has, it has uh, Enroth and Groth as writer <coughs> formats, but I don't think it can read them. But you can go and write a reader. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't think it, it reads the, the Roth formats. Or at least I didn't see it in the list. Um, media wiki markup, uh, markdown slash common mark, restructured text, HTML, um, output formats um, that it can write but not read include EPUB and various ebook formats, uh, PDFs, uh, HTML slash JS slideshows like reveal, etc. Um, the tech, um, including um, Beamer presentations, and the PDF variations thereof, and a whole lot of other stuff. Um, so it can read and write a lot of formats. It's probably not quite as universal as what the actual meaning of universal is. In fact, it's definitely not, but um, it, it does have a lot of formats. Um, you can also write custom writers. So the, the terminology is that readers are the modules that can read um, inputs. Writers write their outputs. Um, you can write custom writers in Lua, as well as it's got a Lua interpreter. Um, but it's actually um, not that difficult to write a first class um, reader or writer as part of Android. It depends on the complexity of the format. I feel like I should have a native format inside this I'm glad you asked. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, so it's written in Haskell, which is really cool, and, and that is partly what makes it actually pretty nice to go in and, and um, you know, modify the readers and writers or write your own, um, which I have. I haven't um, written any readers or writers, but I've made some changes um, to some of the readers and writers. Uh, and it's uh, licensed under the general public license um, to up. Uh, I should also mention, um, I also use Pandoc for other things. So I use Pandoc to uh, write my, my blog. So I have a media with you blog where I blog about work things. And uh, I write my posts in restructured text and then use Pandoc to turn that into HTML. And then I just cut and paste the HTML into the, into the form because I don't want to write it with the silly WYSIWYG editor, and I definitely want, don't want to write HTML. So that's, that's how I write my slides. Um, what else I use it for? I, um, the Hackle um, static site generator, which is written in Haskell, um, does the same sort of thing as Jekyll, which is written in Ruby, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really care. Um, <laughs> It uses Pandoc internally, so there are some sites I've done. For example, the FP Miniconf site um, was generated with Hackle, and most of the pages were restructured text for that. Um, there's something else I use it for. Oh, yeah, for uh, design documents at work that can go on the wiki, which is a media wiki. wiki. Um, and again, I write those in restructured text and then just use Pandoc to convert them to. Um, media wiki markup and just cut and paste them in because I don't want to write media wiki markup because I think restructured text is nicer. And I don't want to learn two dozen different markup formats anyway. So running Pandoc, um, yeah, so yeah, basically the name of the program is Pandoc and you have your input file, you have the double dash two um, or just dash t. Um, to specify the out output format, um, and then dash o to give the name of the file that you want to write it to. Um, for the tech, including Beamer, um, it does actually look at the file extension of this argument here to decide whether it, whether you want just the actual tech file or whether you want it turned into a uh, PDF via PDF or tech. But normally, most writers 
will just um, you know, write it in the same way no matter what you put there. So if you specify the media with your writer, and then you call it slides.pdf, well, you're not going to get a PDF, you're just going to get a media with your file with a strange file extension. Um, you can use the template option to specify a custom template. I'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, highlight style, there's a few different highlighting engines um, supported for highlighting source code. Um, I use pigments. And then specifying a number of variables, so double dash variable or dash V, dash capital V, um, for specifying variables that will be substituted into the template. Every format has a default template. Um, so if you don't specify the dash template, it will just use the default template for the format that you have asked it to convert the document into. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So each document, uh, each um, each Pandoc writer has a default template. Um, you can get the default template just with the free default template uh, option, and then just write that to a file. So if you find that the default template um, doesn't quite do things the way you'd like to do them, then you can get the default template and tweak it to your heart's content. And then just tell Pandoc when you're actually processing the documents, um, how you use this template. Uh, when you are moving from one version of Pandoc to the next version, there might have been changes to the template. So just a quick point that it's worthwhile when you do move from an older version to a newer version to spit out the default template and do a diff and see if anything's changed and you might find that um, the changes that you've made to the template have now been subsumed um, in the default template or maybe you just need to merge the changes from upstream and your own changes. <coughs> okay, so in this next section, um, just going to show you a whole lot of kind of source code, restructured text source code, um, and then on the next slide, the what that actually looks like. Um, so I'm going to assume that most of you are comfortable with, or at least comfortable with, the idea of lightweight markup formats. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but if you have any questions on any particular slide, just shout out, and we'll address it then and there. So uh, the basic format, uh, comments uh, are led in with a double period, um, dot points, just use a dash or an asterisk or a plus, um, and you can have multiple levels of them. So you've kind of got three top level <coughs> points here and then on the final point a couple of sub points. Um, double asterisks uh, are boldface, single asterisk for emphasis or italics. Um, and if you want bold face and italics, use three asterisks. Two plus one is three. Um, double back ticks for a monospace type uh, typeface. Um, so what does this look like when, when it gets turned into a slide? Um, that, so pretty much, did anyone expect to see not that based on the previous <laughs> slide? Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, hyperlinks, so in restructured text, um, just and something that looks like a hyperlink will be turned into a hyperlink in the document. Um, you can also have um, you know, your own text for the link, um, and you can put the, uh, the hyper reference uh, internally in angle brackets or externally in this comment like directive there. So you just have a double period, but it's not a comment, it's actually um, read by the parser and can reference it back against this link with the back ticks and say, oh, okay, now you're supplying the URL for this link, so I can turn it into a hyperlink. And um, that's what you get. So I don't think it's not going to come up with the hover, but yeah, just trust me that that's foo and foo.com and bar and baz. What's with the underscore after the Mm -hmm. Yep, good question. So the underscore is basically saying um, look somewhere else in the document to find out what the URL for this link is. 
So then down here we have the leading underscore and this text here. So we can use that to match up um, this URL with this part of the document. I'd rather one where it's already embedded. Aha, uh -huh. when it's already embedded, then it just says this is a link. I don't know why it needs the trailing underscore, but it does. Uh, incremental lists. So, as you probably noticed, um, all of my slides so far have just gone bam, here's all the dot points. Um, that's the way I like to present usually, uh, but you can also have your dot points come in incrementally, one at a time. Um, and to do that, just basically indent all of your dot points. Um, technically, this gets wrapped in a in a block quote, so it becomes a block quote, um, and then Pandoc itself, so not part of restructured text, but in Pandoc, um, the existence of a bullet list uh, or a, um, a numeric list inside a block quote is interpreted as, hey, um, instead of showing all the slides at once, um, or all the points at once, please turn it into multiple slides, showing you one. Uh, on each slide. There's also a command line switch to Pandoc to invert this default behavior so it can make it that the default is incremental lists and then when you put it in block quote uh, it shows all the uh, all the points at once. So this is the result, you get one at a time. Um, you also notice the hashes there. Um, so in fact you can make this whole list just hashes and it'll start at one um, which is sensible because it makes your um, source ma more maintainable. So if you decide, oh, I need to put something else in there, you don't have to go and renumber everything. Uh, source code. Mm -hmm. So um, with the so this is this is called a roll now. Again, it starts with double period, not a comment. Um, this syntax is a roll. Um, this is the code roll, and the first argument to the code roll is the name of the language which um, the pigments engine will use to work out which highlighting it should use. So this is just some code in Haskell, and we'll go to the next slide, and there we have it. Um, nice <laughs> syntax highlighting for our Haskell code. <coughs> um, yeah, and pigment supports 300 different languages. Yo. Um, if you say wanted to step through lines of code, maybe on well, um, uh, emphasize or uh, bold and line by line, is there any way of doing that? Um, like in subsequent slides, the same as you yeah. revealing points? Yes. Yeah. Restructured text will not give you that power. You can do it with Beamer. I personally never tried to do that. I try and keep code examples in my presentations to a digestible length. Mm -hmm. um, but often, often you'll want to show even, even differences between you know, one, one slide and the next and highlight here's things that changed when we did such and such a refactor or whatnot. So I haven't tried to do it. I think you can probably do it with Beamer. Um, just using the code role in restructured text will not give you enough control to do that. Uh, cool. So the math role can be used for um, for math expressions or you know, um, equations, proofs, and so on. Um, this is the block version of this role. So if we go to the next slide, there we have our beautiful continued fraction. And we can, yeah. Question. Uh, yep. Can you like automatically output like MathJax style stuff? Or, oh, sweet. Yeah, <laughs> great, great question. We'll get to that. Um, so you, you'll notice the, the input or you won't notice if you don't know any tech. This is actually um, tech math inside this block. So this just gets carried through as tech until it reaches the writer. Now, because we're using a, a tech writer or a tech writer, um, it can just go and take that to block straight in the document but just put it in an expression, in an uh, expression line. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, equation. Equation line or something. Um, in this case, in this case, um, but 
if you're using a different writer, then there are things that Pandoc can do to turn it into, for example, MathJax, um, MathNL, and so on. Uh, the math role can also be used in lines. <coughs> we have here a new syntax with the name of the role in between uh, columns, and then the single backticks containing the uh, expression to be interpreted uh, within the named role. So here we just have a math expression for the uh, n choose k formula, and you can see it appears in line and nicely formatted. That's how you want your math to look. I think it is. Anyone disagree with that? You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, further from math now, uh, what if we want to just write some raw text? So we know that we we know that we're going to be using Beamer for this slideshow, and maybe we want something that Beamer will give us the power to do that just plain old restructured text won't. So if you want, for example, multi-columned slides, you want two columns of things in your slide, or uh, tables. Restructured text does actually support tables, but if you think LaTeX tables are horrible, you haven't tried to make tables <laughs> with restructured text. Um, <laughs> So we have the raw role, um, followed by as the first argument, the name of the, the format, uh, the format of the content inside the role, um, which in this case is LaTeX. Now Pandoc will actually um, interpret using, a, using one of its readers anything in a raw role that it knows how to read. So if I said org mode, you could write an org mode table in here, and then that'll get Turned in, they'll get parsed using the uh, org mode reader and turned into just part of this AST, Pandoc's internal AST, and then converted into whatever format you ask for. Um, but yeah, so basically, this, this is just a, a table. Again, don't worry too much about the tech. Um, but that's, whoops, that's the result. So there we get a nice table. Uh, now we can use the uh, raw role inline, but we have to do a bit more work because in the inline format between the columns, there's actually nowhere to specify arguments. So we have to define a new role, which is basically a sub role of raw, and then supply the arguments in the role definition. So here we define using the role role, um, a new role called LaTeX based on raw, and then we supply arguments, in this case the format argument and the tab. So now our restructured text will know to interpret anything in the LaTeX role as though it were in a raw role with the LaTeX um, format argument. Um, so this, this way we can use LaTeX to write LaTeX in the nice latex way and do other things like text numero and subscripts and all that good stuff. Okay, uh, images. So we want to include images or diagrams in the slides. Well, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So we use the image role. Um, the first argument there is the um, path or the URL to the image. And then we can specify arguments like the width that we want the image to be. Um, in the case of Beam, and that's going to be the, um, a proportion of the frame width, or you can specify an absolute value as well. So you can specify it in centimetres or inches, um, and the alignment, and then we get our image. So this is um, this file, file extensions.pm, is just sitting in the directory beside you know, my restructured text source file. So the um, PDF or tech is going to go and pick that up and put it in my document. Unicode, you know, special characters, particularly if you're doing technical presentations, there's a pretty high chance you might want to include some in your presentation. <coughs> so with the uh, PDF LaTeX engine, which is the default, um, you use the input ink um, package. And in the default template is this line, use package option UTF-8 input ink. Um, with the UTF-8 option, you have to 
specify a mapping for any Unicode characters that appear in the source file to a sequence of LaTeX source um, that will be substituted for that character. So if we want to use the for all character in our document, so the upside down A, um, which is Unicode character 2200, um, we would have to include this in the preamble. Declare Unicode character uh, 2200 and then some LaTeX here, which is just the backslash for all. So we're saying we want the for all character inside a math environment, which is what those dollar signs are. Again, not a LaTeX tutorial. Um, <coughs> so that can be a bit of a pain. Um, instead, you can use the UTF-8X option, uh, which will require you to edit the template or use a custom template, uh, which loads UCS, which is a library of many predefined mappings um, of this nature. Uh, some people say you should avoid UTF-8X because UCS was unmaintained, but then I believe it is now maintained again. Um, the other thing is that it doesn't afford you much control, so you just have to use the, the mappings that, that um, come to you through the UCS package. So there are trade-offs there. But in general, uh, where I have wanted to have Unicode characters in my restructured text source and have them appear as that character in the document, I have used UTF-8X and have never had it do not what I wanted. So that's just my experience. Your mileage may vary. Um, Lula Tech is the next generation um, successor to PDF LaTeX, sort of the anointed successor. Um, it supports direct UTF-8 input. Um, I have played with it. My main gripe with it is that certain characters that typically appear in math environments will work fine in a math environment and will just not appear outside a math environment. So for all is a good example. You'll see the dollars here that puts it in a math environment, but then that math environment can appear anywhere, in, you know, inside a text environment. Um, but with Lua Tech, if your character that you want to use is defined in a math environment but not in a text environment, then either your document won't compile or it might just disappear from the document. Um, so I don't know what the way around that is. Maybe it's just to accept that if you're dealing with math, then just be in a math environment. Doesn't seem entirely unreasonable, does it? Anyway, I'm moving on because this is not a LaTeX tutorial. <laughs> uh, did you have a question? Yeah. No. Okay. So the title page, uh, you will note that my presentation had a title page with a title and everything. Um, so there are various Pandoc variables that you can supply. Um, as arguments to the Pandoc command, um, including title and subtitle and author and date. And these will be substituted into the template um, to give you your title page. Importantly, the title page will only be added if the title variable is defined. So if you want a title page but not a title, sorry, you can't do that or you'll have to modify the default template. Uh, you can use raw tech in the values, um, but you just make sure your backslashes are adequately escaped. Uh, for general appearance things now, um, the being the default is to use a sans serif typeface for math, which I think looks absolutely horrible. But you can say uh, you can add this to the preamble. Um, use font theme, only math serif. That will make the math be in a serif typeface. Um, you can colour your hyperlinks and you can set the colours that you want for internal links or <coughs> external hyperlinks in your document. Um, you can add a logo, you can adjust the aspect ratio, so I think we should do some of this stuff. Let's have a bit of fun, eh? Okay, so this is, this is my um, build script which I run to actually turn my talk.restructuredText, which is this thing. So this is 
this is my talk here. Is this big enough for people? Um, so this is, this is, yeah, this is what I write when I write a talk. This is what I run when I want to build it. And uh, occasionally I'll have to go and add things or tweak things in here. So you can see here, um, first of all, and I'll come back to this in a minute, but you'll notice I'm actually using um, a development build of Pandoc, not using Pandoc from the package manager because I wanted to change some things, um, which I'll talk about a bit later. But we build um, talk.restructured text, which is the source file, and we want to spit out Beamer and the output files from this slice or PDF. And we're going to use the pigments highlight style. And we've got our subtitle and title and author. That's not relevant. Uh, and the date today. So if I was to build this tomorrow, the PDF will have tomorrow's date in it. Uh, now we can supply the class option variable, which will add to the template um, this following this option for the um, for the document class. So we're setting the aspect ratio to 16.9. The default aspect ratio is 4.3. So if I was to remove that and uh, build, then my slides are now in 4.3. Uh, we don't want those to be black bars, so I'll, I'll change that back. Um, there's a bunch of other aspect ratios, 5.4 and 16.10 and so on. Um, down here, um, we can supply extra stuff to the, um, to the LaTeX preamble with the header includes variable which can be supplied multiple times as can class option. So again, just going off what we've seen in the previous slide, um, we've got our hyperlinks, maybe we can change the URLs to be blue or something, and if we remove this header includes, I can make all of my math look really horrible. <laughs> and if we just go back through the slides, now we have horrible, oh, look at that horrible, who wants to look at math like that? <laughs> oh, it's I think it's ghastly. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. And what was the other thing I changed? Oh, links. Yeah, so now the links are blue instead of purple. So, or if we, um, yeah, link color. So this is the link color is for um, internal links in the document. So if I remove that, I'm not sure what will actually change. But I I suppress the colored internal links. So do we have any internal links in this document? Maybe we don't. Anyway, I'm not going to worry too much about that. I'm going to change everything back to how it was. Cool. <clears throat> any questions on this stuff? Like, I noticed that you seem to only be able to use PNG. Like, is that the only... Uh, no, sports JPEGs and whatnot. SVGs are a little bit more work, you can do it. The results are generally very nice. Um, but the graphic X package, um, which is the standard way of including, or a, a common way of including graphics in, in uh, the tech documents, doesn't support SVG out of the box. So you have to. So what I do, actually, you can see my SVG command up here. So when I have a, um, uh, a presentation, I want to include an SVG in it. Um, I can just do you know, SVG command foo SVG here to run this, which will convert the SVG into um, a PDF, and then I can include that PDF in the document in a raw the tech block. So it's a little bit roundabout, but the results are typically quite nice. And it also means that you can keep the size of your repository down, because you can include the SVG, which is a text format. Or if you want to change the SVG, you can get diffs on the SVG, etc. I'm just assuming that people version control their talks because they, you would be crazy not to, I think. Um, but maybe I'm the crazy one. So, oh, uh, and a final note on Unicode uh, when it comes to um, foreign scripts, so non Latin scripts, um, you could do it with PDF LaTeX, it's typically pretty finicky, but 
Um, if you can get it right, if you need to use Greek or um, Chinese or Arabic or whatever, um, you can do it. The results are typically very nice, but getting there can be a little bit painful. I haven't had to give any presentations in Arabic yet, so I'm <coughs> thankful for that. So, uh, appearance. Oh, a logo. Let's, let's add a logo. So again, we'll add another header includes. And we'll say uh, logo. And include graphics. And we'll make it, say, 0 0.4 centimeters high. BFPG.ping. graphics. Oh yeah, height equals that tends to help. Yeah, I think now we got a little BFPG logo in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that nice? Um, okay, and Beamer themes, right? So Beamer has themes uh, which control the layout of the slides and it also has colour themes. Um, there's this link that Beam a theme matrix, or you can just plug that into your web search engine of choice and find it pretty easily. And you can see what all of the themes look like. Most of them are horrible. You can write your own themes too. Um, there's a bit in the um, LaTeX wiki book on that, there's a link to that at the end of the slides. Um, so there's actually uh, dedicated variables for the themes and the color themes. So if we make our theme Singapore, well, most of the, <coughs> all of the themes in the official Beamer class, all of the official themes are named after um, cities, and the colour theme, um, I can't remember the names of the colour themes, there's one, um, Beaver, which is not too offensive. I can only remember it because it has a um, difference of one from Beamer, Bernstein distance. Uh, yeah, so here we go, we've got our colour theme now. The theme is slightly different, or I could make you want to gouge all your eyes out of your heads and use the Warsaw theme. Warsaw. Yeah, <laughs> do not want. <laughs> but hey, you can you can do it. Um, okay, let's just pretend to land of sanity. Um, <laughs> themes, speaker notes. Uh, yeah, so this is the source speaker notes. This slide has speaker notes. Yada yada. We've got another role. This role is called class. Um, and then we need to supply the argument notes and then everything in that it will appear on pages that are speaking notes. So if we go to the next slide you'll see that the actual stuff that was in the notes class, uh, the notes role, no, the, the class role with the notes argument have disappeared but here they are in the speaking notes slide where we have a preview of this slide. And uh, whatever content we had in the um, in the class role. Now there are, so this, this appears because I've given the class option um, notes equals show. If I change it to notes equals only, then it will give me only these pages. And these pages are only going to appear where you've actually got a slide with speaker notes. So I'm not going to do that because it will pump me back to slide two and I'll have to go through the, the presentation again. Um, but you can add the speed notes. And certain other um, slideshow writers have support for speed notes as well, notably um, Reveal Jades. Okay. Um, so, other approaches or ways that you can vary this approach that I've been speaking about tonight. Um, you could use other markup formats if you really want. So, I. <coughs> 
you know, you could write media with your markup or um, um, mark down, whatever you want. Um, Pandoc will read them, usually. Um, you can write raw beamer, which gives you all of the power of, of LaTeX and beamer, um, but with great power comes more boilerplate. Um, <coughs> and you can use uh, uh, HTML slash JS slideshow format writer. So if you want your fancy transitions, if you want your animated GIFs in your presentation, um, then you can um, make a reveal JS slideshow. So we can do that now. Uh, so I'll just comment out all of the preamble things, comment out the template, because obviously that template won't be suitable for HTML. Um, class options we can just ignore, they're not gonna that variable's not gonna exist in um, in the reveal.js template. Now we need uh, to change our converting to format to reveal.js and call it slides.html. And you'll note I have reveal.js um, a checkout of the reveal.js system sitting um, beside my source code here. You could probably also configure it to grab it from a CDN or something. Um, the other important thing we want to do is if we want our um, math to look nice, we want to supply um, uh, math jacks. So like half a different, half a dozen different um, systems in Pandoc or features to convert the map into something else. So you can put it in the man page in Pandoc. Uh, yeah, so yeah, math rendering in HTML. So you've got the tech math ML, math ML, JS math, math Jax, glad tech, mind tech, but I don't even know what all of these are, right? Um, I had to play around with a bunch of them this afternoon. The only one that gave me any results worth showing is MathJax. So, um, if you supply it without an argument, it's going to default to including the CDN URLs in your output. Um, you can also give a local one, you know, file, yada yada, my MathJax here or whatever. Um, I actually couldn't get good results from that. I don't know what the reasons were. Everything was in the right place, but all of the colors and the CSS was whacked. So, Which version was it? Uh, the latest. Huh. Um, the, but I don't know if it matches what's on the CDN necessarily. So, unfortunately, I don't have the um, internet on my laptop at this moment. But let's build this thing anyway and let's have a look what happens. Um, so if I now go uh, Firefox slides.html and uh, yeah, there's it. So here's our beam of slides. We'll go down and, and have a look at our, um, there's our source code, uh, some source code. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Caches for the win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. yeah, I guess so. I believe mean, that worked. I'd even, sa I'd even saved the copy just to go, oh, here's one I prepared earlier, so I could show you this. So, did I actually build it? I did build it, didn't I? Slide station. Oh, no, hang on. Doing. Do you have uh, yeah, yeah, because I because I hard re reload and it's trying to load it from I don't know what's happening now. Can't load it. Anyway. Um, that's what it looks like when it works, which is nice. And um, anyway, I'll close that. So um, yeah, you can get you can get pretty good results moving between PDF and different output formats. Not everything is gonna look alright there, particularly where I've um, Actually, what do the tables look like? I'm really curious. I'm 
equals tab. Uh, mathjax <coughs> equals. <coughs> nope. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's what the mathjax looks like when it's playing. Um, <coughs> I was going to look at the table. There's the table. Rule of tech. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, there's that. But, yeah, generally the, the basic formatting all, all carries through and um, shows you what you want to see. Okay. Anyone have any good questions about that? Awesome. So I'm going to talk a bit about Pandoc internals now. Um, very quickly, so it's getting on. So, um, Pandoc is defined across a number of repos repositories. Um, there's the Pandoc Types repository, which just basically has the raw AST and um, some combinators for more easily building up um, documents, rich documents without having to do it all directly with the AST constructors. So uh, we have a look at the, kind of the essence of the AST. We have block elements. So these are things like paragraphs, code blocks, um, bullet lists, order lists, tables, um, div, which is just a generic container with attributes. Um, and then there's inline elements, and this is where you have kind of your, you know, boldface emphasis or strong emphasis, subscript, superscript, um, inline math, inline raw, raw stuff, uh, hyperlinks, images, etc. So this is what the AST looks like. Um, in the text.pandoc.builder module um, is where you have these combinators for um, more easily building up um, the AST. So you have strong, for example, just um, gives you a uh, single list of whatever you gave it wrapped in the strong constructor. Um, yeah. Code with, so this new constructor um, inline code element with given attributes. Yeah, space, just a single space. Um, so what does a document actually look like when it's converted to the AST? Um, <clears throat> I have here a very, very small restructured text document. It could be a slideshow, it could be, you know, it depends what you want to convert it into. Um, so if we have a look at um, Pandoc's um, uh, native writer, native is the name of the format, so you can read and write the native format. Uh, so we do Pandoc, uh, actually I'm going to go and use my Pandoc for this. Pandoc, um, the input file, tiny.restructuredText, we're going to read restructured text, we're going to write the native format, we're going to output the standard out. Uh, what are you doing? supposed to be no, was that meant to be a dash o? Was that meant to be dash Yes, o? it's meant to be a dash o, not a dash p. Thanks. There we go. Um, so this is this is the internal representation of that document. So we can see uh, we've got some headers at the top level, header one and header one, and um, yeah, there's various attributes, and then the uh, text, this slideshow, and even the spaces in between words are actually a first class part of the AST. Uh, then we have a bullet list, um, which yeah, just gives you plain text, and then that text is, itself is broken out into a list. 
um, of strings and spaces. And then further down we have our image, which is inside a paragraph with a single uh, singleton list containing that image. And it's picked out these attributes uh, with 40% in the line center from the image role. So it's going to carry those attributes along in, a, in basically, in a, well, it's a list of tuples, but it's treated as an associated map of keys to values. And uh, then the target file extension stop here, and so on. <coughs> so it's just a very small example of what a document looks like when Pandoc reads it. And if you want to write a reader, um, you've got to go from your input to an AST um, like this. And when you write a writer, you've got to go from this to a serialized stream of whatever it is you want to output. So, um, when you look at a reader, we can um, have a quick look at a part of the restructured text reader here. Um, most of the readers in Pandoc itself use Parsec, and Parsec is a dependency, but you don't have to use Parsec. Um, for example, the reader for the native format just does a safe read of <laughs> the file, so it uses like Haskell's read and show is basically the um, the reader and the writer for the native format. So a role is called a directive um, inside the uh, restructured text reader. So we can see here the directive um, first tries to read the double colon and um, then the next parser directive prime which is this one. So we're going to skip many spaces. Uh, we're going to read a label, which is um, going to be something like role or code or image. Um, we're going to skip some more spaces. And then till the end of the line, um, we're going to take that as the first argument, which will be, for example, in the case of code, um, the name of the language, like Haskell. Or for an image, it's going to be the target, the file name. Then it tries to read a new line, reads a bunch of fields, uh, which is the, those additional um, attributes or arguments to the role. Then it reads the body of the role, which it reads as an indented block, so on and so forth. And then, then it does things, different things depending on the um, on the label, so depending on what the role actually is. So if it's raw. Um, it's going to return a raw block. If it's a role, it adds a new role, which you can then use um, later on in its processing, and so on and so forth. You can see there's a whole lot of different roles supported here. Um, math, we use that a few times. Um, images, so that's the one that I'm interested in in, uh, in our document. We can see here that it's um, look up old fields, maybe image, etc. Yeah, so it reads the attributes um, using this image attribute function. Which is defined up here in a let expression. So this is where it pulls out the width and the height and those sorts of attributes and uh, attaches them in that associated map to the image uh, here. So we've got image, atra, uh, list of inline expressions, and then the target, um, which is the file name. <coughs> so why am I showing you this? Um, basically, uh, it's because the support for the um, Alignment of the image is what I've added in my custom version of Pandoc, and I've got an open pull request for that currently. So, in any released version of Pandoc, the image is always aligned to the left, and the only way to get it not on the left is to break into raw restructured text and either give a centering um, command uh, or just 
actually write your backslash and quick graphics in the raw tech itself. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have an attribute like a line, called a line, where I can just say this is the alignment of the image. And uh, we have a look at my pull request or, or the diff. Um, just go to the uh, restructure text reader here. So. Um, I've added this align value um, to the image after a function, or to the, to the tuple that it returns. And the align is defined as I'm going to look up a line in the fields. So I'm looking for an align um, argument. And then if it's there, I'm going to look in that for the first of center or right or left. And which, which, are, which ever is the first of these that I find, if I find any of these at all, then I'm going to add that um, to the image and carry that through Pandoc to the writer. And then if a writer wants to look for that and decide that it will try to align the image, it can do that. Um, and so I've done that also for the LaTeX writer. So in the inline to LaTeX function, um, pattern matching on an image, Instead of say image atra, right. So instead of ignoring the attributes, um, I'm actually going to break them open and get out the key value map. And then I'm going to look up a line in that key value map. And if it's left or center or right or absent, um, I'm going to go to an align left, align center, align right, or align default constructor of an alignment type, which is an internal type in, uh, in Pandoc. And then uh, finally, this block down here, so in, if in heading, then yada yada, this is what is actually returned for this function by the reader. But now I'm going to say, OK, align in, align, so this alignment here, this, um, this block, and then align in is basically going to, depending on the alignment given, whether it's left or right or centre or default, going to lift the document that is given up into a new LaTeX environment of flush left, flush right, or centre, uh, or in the event that it's aligned default, we're just going to do nothing and leave it as is. So it'll do whatever the document class says to do with it. Um, so that's basically the change I made. I found it pretty easy to read the code. Um, and to go ahead and make that change. And now it's in pull request limbo. But um, yeah, um, hopefully I've shown you that um, Pandoc is actually reasonably nice to work with. Um, that's all stringly typed, of course. The, the appropriate change to make would be to, um, rather than carrying that information as key values, I, I should carry an alignment um, argument on the image data constructor, which would be align left, align right, align center, or align default. The reason I didn't make that change is because, as I said earlier, um, Pandoc types is one repository and Pandoc is a separate repository. So I'm going to have a situation where I have to make a change in one repository, which would then break anyone building Pandoc against the upstream Pandoc types repository. So there's no way to make an atomic change sort of Pandoc-wide <coughs> to introduce what I think would be the nice way of making this change. But anyway, we'll see what they come back with on my pull request. It's, uh, there's certainly uh, plenty of precedent for doing nasty, stringly typed things um, on you know, the reader side and then carrying that through to the writer side. So I think it could be better, um, and I definitely think that having two repositories is something of a barrier to making these, these um, larger factors or implementing features in a more type safe way than what I just did. But nevertheless, that I think is the minimum, minimum thing I can do to get the feature in there. So we'll see what happens. Um, resources. Uh, yeah, the wiki books, uh, the wiki book on LaTeX is really, really good. It's not just 
Beamer, of course. Beamer is just a little slideshow, so you can take his one chapter of many. Great resource. Um, the restructured text uh, documentation is quite thorough. Um, the text stack exchange is really good as well. Um, if you have questions, chances are you weren't the first one to have it, and there's a lot of useful answers there. That's where I go to find out things like how do I put an SVG in my in my slideshow or in my the tech and learn the ways to do that. Um, the Beamer documentation um, is um, it's comprehensive, so if you want to really embrace Beamer and see all that it can do, that's the place to go. And pandoc, pandoc.org um, is the home of Pandoc. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Any questions? I'm assuming that you. Sorry, go ahead. You're right, Raul. Okay, so I was assuming you don't need to use restructured text, you can use Markdown. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you use whichever um, you know, inferior mark, markup <laughs> um, It's entirely up to you, and I understand many people are much more familiar with Markdown. Which flavour of Markdown is a good question, but um, yeah, plenty of people will default to Markdown, and, and the Markdown reader is good in handle, probably better than the restructured text reader, just through sheer volume of use. Yeah. Um, we demonstrated how you could um, generate a version of the slides with the uh, speaker notes. Yep. Is there any easy way to do the thing where you display one set of slides to the audience and have your cheat sheet? With a PDF, I don't know. Um, and I've never tried to do that. With Reveal.js, yeah, it, can, it puts them in a separate window. And you can throw that up on a different monitor and they can use, still communicate so they go forward when, when you go forward. It's unfortunate that it doesn't make empty slides, the ones that don't have notes on them. Because otherwise you could just get two P PDF viewers that were in lockstep. It would be fine. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, you you a could cool add reason. a um, you could add a notes class role to every slide yeah. and just leave it empty if you don't have anything and to say if about it. One. You can and then if you forgot one, you're totally screwed. You can probably put it in template. Yeah. 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 Uh, yep. So you could. Yeah. Yeah. You could. Pr uh, How would that merge? No. Nah, yeah. Let's see. You could you could put it in the writer, so you could modify the writer and have an option like if there's no notes, add an empty note slide, or add a, add an empty note, um, because in Beamer, notes slides are not actually separate slides. Yeah, they're just metadata within a particular slide that then gets rendered into a separate slide. Yeah. So you could update the. Um, you could update the writer to to support that sort of feature. Have they registered an application Pandoc one time? Because I would love if my emails came in that lovely Haskell readable format <laughs> rather than HTML. I don't know. I'm dealing with the problem right now where that would be lovely. <laughs> Anyhow. Well, you know my um, opinion span on HTML and email, but I, I hereby, I hereby give, you, give you freedom to send me I'll start sending raw Pandoc Pandoc AST as yes, email. Uh, I'm happy to receive it. <laughs> <laughs> but because it's, only, because it's only going to be a very small pipeline for me to turn that into something beautiful inside Mark. So, yeah, yeah that's fine with me. Type, I'm sure it's for Haskell applications. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you mentioned like there was a UTF-8 way of just putting just straight UTF-8 code in there direct, right? You said Lua Latex or something? Yeah, so Lua Latex is, um, is the successor to PDF Latex, which is the default um, Latex engine used by, um, used by Pandoc. So Lua Latex um, just lets you write, uh, it handles um, UTF-8 characters in the input and carries them through into the output with caveats like that, which I mentioned, like, for example, the for all in the for all character in the input um, will only appear in the output if you were inside a math environment when you wrote it. 
Now, I don't know if that's a bug or by design, yeah. and um, Lula Tech, I get the sense, is still, uh, still a moving target. It's not very mature yet, yeah. so this situation could change. Cool. All right. Thanks, Grace. No worries. Thank you. Now you all have to write BFDG talks. <laughs>